The great temples of Cambodia, once houses of devotion, healing, and celebration, are now quiet. What remains are pieces of a past. In those pieces are carved Buddhas, seated on the thick, coiled bodies of the sacred snake called the Naga. In a Cambodian legend about creation, the Naga were a serpent race of beings who lived in the Pacific Ocean. The Naga king's daughter married an Indian Brahmin, and from their union was born the Cambodian people. She was a Naga snake, and he an Indian Brahmin. The Naga is a long-used Hindu form, seen independent of other figures, or as an instrument of their divinations. It's often elongated and held by asuras and devas, like here, as the rail of Prayakan. At Angkor Wat, the Naga is in the East Gallery, at the center of this eternal tug of war in the churning of the Sea of Milk. In the 12th century, it rose to become a principal form of devotion when it was combined with the seated Buddha. During the rule of King Jayavarman VII, a cult devoted to the Naga Buddha flourished. Buddha, sitting on top of the Naga snake, became a popular form in Cambodia during its classical Angkorian period. But this form also appeared in India and Southeast Asia earlier on. During its classical period, Cambodia ruled over a vast kingdom, including neighboring Vietnam and parts of Laos, Burma, and Thailand. Today, the ruins of the kingdom are clustered in Angkor. At the Bayan, the combining of Jayavarman's features in the face of Buddha proclaims the ruler as a god and king. The politics of art are in the temple's bas-relief carvings, and in the image of the Naga Buddha as seated ruler. But the Naga Buddha is first and foremost a religious icon. This Buddha became the image of absolute perfection and represented the cosmic quality of the enlightened spirit. His beauty is astounding eyes the color of sapphires, skin so fine that no dust can attach to it, and on his feet are the thousand-spoked wheels of his teachings. As he walks, he spreads his wisdom. But the Naga Buddha is a conflicted image, a still figure meditating upon a coiled snake. The snake is at full alert, in a stance of protection, while the human, who he so desired to become, sits quietly reveling in his first taste of nirvana.
The contrasts in the sculpture are in Cambodian life and culture, balance and movement, peace and ferocity, human and animal. These contrasts are present in antiquity and in Cambodia today, and meditation witnessed in the daily repetitions of life. How is this image of meditation visualized in museum collections, in temples, and in the lives of the Khmer people? At worship sites around the ruins of the former kingdom, current use continues. The desire to find a higher existence reflects that of the Naga, who desired to be reborn from an animal into a monk, into the human form that he protects. Through the conscientious observation of prayer, worshippers aspire to the same transformation. Located in the vicinity of the Bayan, this outdoor sculpture is a more recent concrete version. Here, Buddha is seated in an enclosed shrine at the end of a terrace procession. Its colossal scale is unusual, although a handful of large-scale examples did exist. The Naga Buddha's continued use is evident. Decorated with canopies and umbrellas, robes and flags, incense, and flowers. In both temples and museums, ornamentation and offerings are given in a continual use of the object. Whether for genuine worship or the tourist industry, the use of Buddhist and Hindu figure sculpture is alive and well in Cambodia. Protected in the National Museum of Art in Cambodia's capital of Phnom Penh are some of the most valuable Naga Buddhas. Others are scattered outside of Cambodia, including Berlin, Paris, and New York. The artifacts in Phnom Penh are among the highest quality of the Angkorian and pre-Angkorian periods. The sculpture of the Buddha sitting inside of this mythical serpent originated in Hinduism, exported from India to Cambodia around the 10th century. Then, with the rise of Buddhism, also an Indian export, came the combining of the snake with the Buddha. It is this combined form that would have overriding importance in the 12th and 13th centuries in Cambodia. The Naga here is protecting Gautama Buddha as he sits in meditation, attaining enlightenment. The Naga is coiled three times around, providing a pedestal for the seated deity. Buddha's right foot is always folded above the left with soles turned upward. The hands are folded on top in the hand gesture or mudra of meditation, mimicking the feet, the right placed over the left. His body is perfectly symmetrical and his facial expression in bliss and peace. Rising from behind the Buddha is the serpent. At the waist it widens until it reaches a full opening at top. His hood 
provides a shield and slight overhang. Inscribed in the back is a scaly pattern with interspersed wheels, similar to the symbols of teaching on the Buddha's feet and hands. But on the Naga, they are potent reminders of his poison, his guardianship over Buddha. The director of the National Museum of Art in Phnom Penh, Kun Semen, describes, so, so the Naga, the, this Naga, very dangerous for everybody except Buddha. This carved articulation is all intended to protect the Buddha from hardships and distractions, to maintain the stillness and grace that compose his entire being. The Naga's constant state of ferocious protection wins the Buddha his bliss, as described in a 9th century inscription at Bakum. The resplendent Buddha has attained eternal kinghood enlightenment. This most sublime of kings delights in his splendid palace, Nirvana. Here at the East Gopura, or gateway, to Prekan, the Naga stretches across each side of the bridge that leads to the temple. All temples in Cambodia were designed to create a division between the physical world and the sanctuary of the gods on the other side. The Naga borders this division. It lays down between this world and the sacred realm. The Naga is both the origin of creation and shield of protection that stretches from the beginning of Khmer legend. At its end is the seven-headed hood, opened out fully. We are faced with the divine before stepping into the next realm, leaving behind the ordinary world. Naga bridges crossed moats that surrounded the temples in Cambodia, as seen here at Angkor Wat. The moat symbolizes the oceans, the birthplace of the Naga. It surrounds a perfect sanctuary, reflects the heavens, and divides sacred from secular. After crossing a moat representing separation, the devotee begins a deliberate passage from the external world, reflecting the spiritual journey inward. Buddhist temples in the classical Angkorian period were built as passageways to walk through. Like the long body of the Naga, the design of each temple built in the 12th century is also based upon a long central axis as seen in the plans of Bhante Kadai, Preya Vihir, and Taprom. The clustering of rooms along this axis provided a clear directional procession. The central axis was punctuated by statuary, most frequently in the form of Hindu lingas and Naga Buddhas. At each sculpture, the devotee would walk around the devotional object, most commonly three times, the same number as the coils of the Naga pedestal. 
This practice of walking around or circumambulation served as a point of reference for meditation and petitioning the gods. Left in the condition in which it was found by the French in the 19th century, Taprom is maintained in a condition of decided neglect. A romantic experiment of art and nature entwined can be devastating to the buildings and its carvings. The roots of the fast-growing banyan tree, commonly known as the strangler fig, grow between dry mortar blocks, choking and stabilizing it at the same time. These uncovered buildings leave carvings exposed to the penetrating sun and torrential rains. But most devastating and demoralizing has been the lure of the black market, where original temple carvings are purchased by eager international buyers. The most valuable parts sold are heads. What's left is a truncated form, the head hacked off, and its protective Naga hood deemed useless. The dozens of Naga Buddhas found here at Taprom alone attest to the hardy commissions and common use of serpent-throned Buddhas at these temples. One of the most important built Vijaya Varman, this temple monastery, was likely a place of healing. We began inside Bante Kadai at this decorated shrine. One of the most beautifully carved Naga Buddhas sits here to the bottom left. Buddha is gone, but the rounded body of the Naga remains, this original source of Kamai creation. This Naga is elegantly carved, one coil draped over the next, with individual scales, the spine just beneath the skin and the thick muscle surround seem to defy stone. A creature that defines motion is made still for the protection of the Buddha. Life is full of opposites. Openings and closings. Lightness and darkness. Stillness and motion. A great tug of war to find a center point. Life is an act of balancing. Pleasure and pain. Art and drudgery. Poverty and prosperity. At the center is stillness and grace, protected by a larger force, like the Buddha beneath the hood of the Naga, or the newborn inside the hammock. Tranquility is at the center of Cambodian life today no matter how chaotic life may be.
know how many people in America? Yeah. 300 million? I don't know the president, Joe W. Bush. All right. And today, your first day here? Yeah, Second day? Oh, yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Can today you hold me one my postcard? Come to your boyfriend. Do you I have, have boyfriend? boyfriend? You know why you don't have a boyfriend? I have a husband. Oh. <laughs> you don't have a boyfriend because you're not buy my card. <laughs> Where are you? I'm right here. <laughs> Where's right here though? Right here is an anchor clock. I want to get the fish! Mom, come on. <laughs> 